I'm speaking now with Tony Kevin. He's a former Australian senior diplomat and an independent commentator now on foreign affairs. Welcome, Ambassador Tony Kevin, to the Unity for J Vigil. Where are you speaking to us from? Uh, from Canberra in Australia. You're in Canberra, in the capital. Okay. So thanks again for joining us. You are one of the few former or current government officials anywhere in the world, really, who have spoken out on behalf of Julian Assange. And my question is, when did you first decide to do this and why? It was shortly after the Bradley Manning disclosures of the terrible massacre from the air in Iraq and the publication of that in, in WikiLeaks. I became very interested in uh, Julian Assange's positive role in world affairs. And when did you first make known your views about him and what was your position at the time? Oh, from the very beginning, Joe, I was determined to say that this man is performing a public service in the interests of free expression and journalism. And I, I made that known through my social media opportunities. While you were still serving the Australian government? No, no, I retired in 1998. What were the reactions to, from people to your call? Was it all positive or negative or probably a mix, right? Julian Assange is a very polarizing figure in Australia. There are people who think he's a traitor to our alliance with the United States, which protects us. And there are people who think that he's a, a fighter for human rights and freedom. People do fall into those two camps pretty quickly, and I'm in the latter camp which I'm glad to say seems to be growing. And the negative reactions, um, were they quite fierce? Because if you'd stand up for Julian Assange today, it's gotten to be, maybe in those days when you first started, but certainly since the 2016 election in the US, the idea is that he somehow was a traitor to the Democratic Party, not to the United States so much. So has that increased your uh, the reactions to you, negative yeah. reactions to you? Yes, it has. It, 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 it has all got hooked up in the current climate of, of anti-Trump uh, Russophobia, the determination to see Putin at the... Uh, in, in, Centre of in all a, things. Yeah, <laughs> Centre of all things. There's a wonderful song by, by Randy Newman about it called Putin, Putin, Putin. And uh, I, I think it's all gone slightly mad, frankly. I can see no connections between Assange and Russia. Uh, unlike some people. I mean, obviously, uh, Ed Snowden has a strong connection with Russia now because they gave him refuge. Fair enough. Um, there's no sign of them having offered or given refuge to Julian Assange. The people who should be protecting him are his own government, Australia. Well, that leads me to my next question. Why have so few government officials, even former ones, come out in his defense? And why isn't the government of Australia doing what you believe, I think, is their legal obligation to protect one of their citizens? You could also include in your condemnation list there the official Australian opposition party, the Labour Party, which looks set to take government in a very few months because the, the Liberal Party are now dead men walking. But all of our conventional mainstream politics is very much constrained by the very close strategic alliance with the United States, which now penetrates rather like Britain into all areas of our political life. We have a thing called Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing, which has in recent years become public. It used to be very secret. And under Five Eyes, we have an obligation to share intelligence assessments with the US, Britain, Canada, and New Zealand. Now, there's no legal obligation under Five Eyes to connive in the persecution of Julian Assange, but it creates an enormous background pressure in the minds of our public officials. My gosh, we'd better not do anything to upset the Americans. But as a government official, they have interests to protect powerful interests, usually interests even more powerful than their own behind them. There has to be some part of the thinking, in, even in Australia, why they don't want to stand up for Assange and why he can be thrown to the, to the wolves, basically, because he's a danger to powerful people. Yes, well, unfortunately, because the American Justice Department and the very powerful deep state forces in Washington have defined Assange as a danger and defined him as a person somehow connected to the arch enemy Russia, they, they feel constrained by that. Uh, considerations of his human rights are 
don't seem to be prevailing, although there are plenty of examples of Australians in trouble overseas where human rights considerations have prevailed. I'm thinking of Peter Gresty, the Australian journalist who was wrongfully imprisoned in Egypt for several years. I'm also thinking of uh, James Ricketson, the Australian journalist detained wrongfully by the Cambodian government. Our government fought for those people's freedom and return to Australia, and there's no reason why, and a lot of Australians believe this, there's no reason why the Australian government shouldn't be fighting for Assange's return from his eight years of temporary and increasingly dangerous asylum in the Ecuador embassy in London. You know, WikiLeaks has revealed files on many, many governments around the world, revealing corruption, crimes, whatnot. They also have revealed files about the Australian government. But you seem to think that it's more the relationship with the U.S., not wanting to get on the wrong side of Washington. That's really behind the inaction of the Australian government. Is that right? That's right. I don't think that Assange has in any way directly embarrassed the Australian government. I can't think of any major case, although I don't know whether WikiLeaks had any to do with recent problems over East Timor. I don't think so, but I could be wrong on that. Why is the relationship with the U.S. so important to the Australian government when there is real no threats to Australia in your region? China is not threatening Australia. What do they need the United States so much for? That they would let one of their own citizens hang out there like that? The Australian government has conditioned itself, and I'm, I'm afraid the opposition has too, to think that we are a very strategically vulnerable country and that China is potentially a threat, as is unbelievably Russia on the other side of the world, <laughs> and that we need to cling closely to nurse for fear of something worse. Uh, it's a very childish, dependent sort of relationship, and uh, speaking as a former Australian ambassador, I'm ashamed of it. We should be standing up for ourselves and making our own foreign policy choices. Sounds like a classic case of politicians creating a false threat, and then they are the ones that will protect the Australian people. And of course, we need the United States to do that. Now, in America, leaders have been doing this for a long time. Even during the first Cold War, they exaggerated the Soviet threat for a number of reasons. That's well documented now, and it's happening now in the second Cold War. And we also see in the first Cold War, there was a McCarthyism where free speech or anybody who opposed American interests or American policy was branded as pro-Russia. And we're seeing it again today. If you don't buy the story, uh, if you simply want detente with the United States without having to love anything about Russia, but simply not wanting tensions between the two nuclear powers, you're being smeared again as a Russia lover. It's the same thing happening again uh, as we saw before. But I think, again, we're seeing, it sounds like what you're saying is Australian leaders are telling their people, look, we really need the U.S. to protect us. We've got to be involved with them. And are the Australian people buying that? And how do they buy that? And what role does the media play in that? Right. That's a good question. Um, like America, we have a thing called inside the beltway. Uh, we don't call it that, but uh, we have the same thing. We have a political, journalistic elite uh, around our capital city where I live, Canberra, uh, which comes to common judgments on these sorts of things. The Australian people, once you get outside that elite, still have a sense of decency, still have a sense of fair play, and will not buy this shit, excuse my language, on air. But unfortunately, inside the Canberra Beltway, there is this realpolitik, um, so-called uh, realistic wisdom. Actually, it's completely unrealistic that, look, whatever Assange has or has not done, he's expendable, and we have to stay on the right side of Washington. And in Washington at the moment, there's obviously a very strong anti-Trump, anti-Russia, anti-China drive, and uh, we have to go with the flow of that. You know, here in the U.S., even the New York Times uh, understands the danger of Assange being prosecuted. They may not like him, and their number two legal counsel said this in a speech to some judges on the west coast of the U.S. a couple of months ago, that we don't like Assange, but we don't want him to be prosecuted because they can come after us, especially this particular administration in Washington now, because we do the same thing Assange has done, which is publish classified information. So if they get him, they can get us. But they don't come out in the editorial pages in defense of Assange either. But we know that from that speech. Is, how did, does the media, at least the non-Murdoch media in Australia, understand that if, if Assange is prosecuted for publishing 
true information that they could be in trouble at some point down the road? There's no sign of it. I'm working very hard through alternative social media to try and get people to think of those highly relevant comparisons, to think of Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. Under the current logic, Ellsberg should still be in jail. To think of Woodward and Bernstein and the Watergate break-ins, Woodward and Bernstein should be in jail. We had an Australian called David Hicks. Now, his case has almost no comparison to Assange's, but the one important comparison is that Hicks was several years in Guantanamo as a suspected Taliban supporter. The Australian government under John Howard did not lift a finger to protect him or to bring him home. Strangely enough, it was left in the end to an American military lawyer, Michael Morey, a hero, I think, to fight for Hicks under American law in American courts and to succeed in him being released and brought home, much to the chagrin and embarrassment of the Australian government which had done absolutely nothing for David Hicks. So I want people in Australia to be aware of that historical comparison. It's highly relevant. Do you think something like that could happen in the Sanders case where uh, someone could step forward? Because right now, um, if he steps out of the embassy, he'll be arrested and most likely extradited. I don't think there's any chance that he won't be. And he'll probably never see the light of day again. What possible relief could there be? What way out is there? Do you see one? For Assange right there is a way out that I can see which requires a certain exercise of courage and decency on the part of an Australian government, whether this one or the next one, which is, I hope, coming very soon. And that is for the Australian government to, first of all, make aggressive representations in London to have Assange's jumping bail charge set aside because the Swedish government has withdrawn all prosecution. So it wouldn't be beyond the capacity of the Australian High Commission in London, our embassy there, to prevail upon the British government to waive that or set it aside. The next step would be, and I, I, I don't want to sound like a John le Carre novel, but things happen, would be for the Australian High Commissioner to drive in his car to the Ecuador embassy to pick up Assange, to drive him under the High Commissioner's protection, possibly with the British police escort, straight to Heathrow Airport onto the tarmac, onto a waiting Australian Qantas plane, because we actually have a direct Qantas flight, the Australian National Airline, from London to Perth without stops. And once Assange is on that plane, there is no way he could be touched by the Americans until he gets to Perth. It would then become an issue for the Australian government and the American government what to do with Assange. But I believe that no Australian government would dare to extradite Assange to the United States without a proper legal process, without a proper charge tested in an Australian court. But do you think that could really happen legally, that once he steps out of the embassy, he's on British territory? I don't think the Australian well, government has legal rights over even an Australian citizen in another country's sovereign territory. Is that right? Well, if the Australian ambassador, High Commissioner, walked into the Ecuador embassy and walked out hand in hand with Assange and put him straight into an embassy car, I cannot see Assange being arrested if, if the Australian government had taken the legal steps beforehand of clearing it with the British government to say, look, this is ridiculous, we're going to take him home. I don't think they'd be able to clear it with the British government very easily, would they? I mean, the power relationship is certainly the other way around. Britain uh, has traditionally more power over Australia. I, I would question and they're in that. Britain, and they're in Britain. I, I would question that. The British government is on the ropes, and they're very weak at the moment. And I think a firm and assertive defence of Australia's citizens' consular rights, as in the case of other countries, Cambodia and Egypt, would actually work if the Australian government had the gumption to push this uh, to the point where it needs to be pushed. Oh, I'd love to see them try it. I don't know if the British police would give them an escort. They might set up a roadblock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing this proposal seriously because what else have we got? I mean... Oh, it's the, brilliant. The I haven't heard that one before, actually. I've heard a lot of silly ideas, but that one's not silly, yeah. The alternative is just to wait for Assange to starve, to freeze to death, or to give up Whatever the alternatives are, they're very bad. So this is an argument for trying something.
I think I may have left out something in the Australian-U.S. relationship that could be important, and you'd know more about this. Uh, what kind of aid comes from the U.S. to Australia, particularly the military and the intelligence services? Well, the intelligence aid is something of a poison chalice because it means we're exposed 24-7 to American disinformation and propaganda about the world, and naturally it influences our strategic community in negative ways. We've lost our independence of strategic assessment, I believe. We don't have any aid from America. They don't do us any favours. In fact, we do them a few favours. We host a very important electronic listening post and control post in central Australia near Alice Springs at a place called Pine Gap, which is a top nuclear target in the event of uh, a nuclear exchange between America and either Russia or China. Pine Gap is used for targeting, for satellite, for surveillance, for everything, and it would be a, a top-ranked target. So we also have an American visiting base. It's a constantly rotating presence of the US Marines in Darwin, in Northern Australia. So we host American bases in Australia. I don't think we owe the Americans anything really, except our imaginary security guarantee. We have this fond belief that if we are attacked by anybody, they will come to our assistance. There is no guarantee of that whatsoever. Well, that's what I was just thinking. What does Australia get out of this? In this even in the Five Eyes arrangement, uh, you're pretty much obliged to give stuff to them, but they're not necessarily going to give you things that, that the Australian security services might need, correct? Well, they give us mountains of stuff, but it's all the American view of the world, which is a very suspect view at the moment. Ultimately, it comes down to a question of Australia asserting its sovereignty as an independent nation against anyone, including the United States. And they would have to do that to defy America, who wants Assange more than anyone, especially the CIA after Vault 7. So they are doing the bidding of the U.S. and not getting much in return, just to sum up what we've been saying here. Is that right? You've hit the nail on the head. Australia needs to reassert its belief, which we had in 1949 when we helped negotiate the U.N. Charter and the U.N. Security Council rules. We need to reaffirm our belief in multipolarity in a concert of independent and sovereign nations who come together in the cause of international security. We have to get away from this idea of us and them, that we are the good guys and Russia and China are the bad guys. There are no good guys, there are no bad guys. There's simply a, a multipolar world in which Australia as a middle power has to navigate its way. I'm not saying we should be anti-American, of course not, or anti-British. But we need to rediscover our independence of outlook. And if Assange came home to Australia, obviously he's not going to be doing WikiLeaks stuff from Australia, but he would be a very important voice in Australia's public foreign policy debate, and I would welcome that voice. Well, I've been talking to Ambassador Tony Kevin from Canberra, Australia, and I really thank you so much for giving us just a few minutes to take part in the vigil for Julian Assange. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All the best. Bye-bye.